coming out tonight. Um, I also want to introduce Emma from Bear Pond Books, who's kind enough to join us tonight to, uh, to be selling Declan's book tonight. So please don't leave without a, without a copy of that in your back pocket. Um, and Declan can certainly sign those for you um, when we wrap up this evening. Um, I also want to introduce Orca Media, that's here recording tonight um, for our local community access TV. Um, and I want to thank you all for just being here at the Nature Center, um, being part of what we do. Um, if you're interested in what we have coming up, check out our website, archivenaturecenter.org slash events. We have all sorts of things coming up. Um, in the near horizon, uh, when we enter the month of October, it will be um, Sawa Owl banding season. And so we have lots of uh, banding demonstrations. And so if you want to turn from kind of uh, stories from, about aquatic research to, um, to avian research, um, come join us for some uh, public owl research demonstrations um, right here in this room um, all throughout October. Um, we also have other um, book launches and festivals and art shows and art openings and things like that um, all throughout the fall. So, um, so come on back sometime. Um, so uh, our relationship with Declan goes way back and is, is multi-layered. Uh, Declan has been involved in our Master Naturalist program um, kind of throughout the state, both as student and as instructor. Um, Declan is a professor at St. Mike's College. Um, has been instrumental in guiding uh, our work around kind of aquatic conservation and education um, and uh, all sorts of various things. If there's an event that, uh, you know, some sort of natural history event, uh, Declan has been involved in it around here. So it's really a pleasure to be able to, uh, to celebrate Declan's uh, book. And um, yeah, and also in addition to picking up the book, um, there's some copies of Northern Woodlands um, out in the lobby here that all feature um, Declan's writing um, and his columns in that publication over the years. So um, check out some of those and take some home if you'd like. Take them home, yeah. There's a big stack of them. <laughs> so yeah, without further ado, I'll turn things over to Declan. Thank you. Thank you very much. It really is uh, a pleasure to be here. Thank you, thank you for hosting this uh, wonderful opportunity. Thanks, and thanks for everyone for coming. So we'll we'll talk about some bugs. Uh, this is a water penny. I just figured I'd put it up there to start off. And um, this is the kind of stuff that um, I've always been fascinated by. And uh, the plan today was to come on out early, get into the north branch of the of the Winooski, and kick up some bugs. But when the weather is like it has just been, um, not only is it doggy getting in and out of the river. But the insects actually go down into the sediment and to avoid being churned up by all those rocks that are rolling over in the, in the high current. So uh, you're not going to get any bugs. And so when people like me go to sample, we try to avoid and actually wait for, you know, maybe a week after conditions like this before we would sample. So, but Lake Champlain, as it happens, is down. So I was there three weeks ago and it was at 97 feet and now it's two or three feet lower than that. So you can wander on out into Lake Champlain and get all the bugs you want, which is what I did today. So the downside is I can't release them up here anymore because there's zebra mussels in the mix and we don't want to be moving them around the place. So all kinds of fun things to think about. I'm going to show you a few slides. And uh, th th there's some bugs at the back of the room there as well on another microscope, on Sean's microscope. If anybody is interested in um, that type of thing, um, oh, there we go. A setup like that would cost about $140, $150. So it's not out of reach at all. And then you can wire it to your television or whatever you want. I'm just going to shine these lights somewhere else so no one's getting blinded by the reflections. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, anyone, anyone blinded? We're good? OK. So um, so yeah, uh, this, this is, a, is about the book I put together. And, and the book is uh, in large part because I've had the opportunity to work with uh, Lauren Woodlands Magazine folks. And uh, I guess we're going to do this again. There we go. Or it's completely locked up. Oh, yeah, it's completely locked up. There we go. It'll be a very short presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions? <laughs> uh, you're going to love that. So, uh, yeah. Well, Sure, make changes. I don't care what you do with this one. So anyway, um, if it doesn't come, oh, there we go. Uh, okay. And if you want to hear more stuff like this, um, I have a podcast that you can you can go listen to. And uh, yeah, I'm, you know, my, my, my daughter made a nice little. <laughs> so if that's your thing, if you're a podcast person, just go find nature snippets, and you'll hear more about bugs. And short little bits that you can, you know, listen to when you're commuting. So the book is short essays. 
Um, I started writing these a while back. Um, I wrote one for a newsletter. And Ad uh, the, um, Elise, um, who is the editor of Northern Wonderlands, found it and said, hey, can you shorten that down and you know, fix the grammar and the spelling a little bit? And, you know, make it 800 words and send it back to me. I said, oh, sure. And I've been doing it ever since. And uh, it's just been, uh, it's, it's a nice way to get stuff out so that people can, can get some of this material and I can share the stuff that I need. Because honestly, most people I know don't pick up the Journal of the North American Pentological Society I never read any of those things. So, um, I've been having fun. And then um, Adelaide Murphy Tyrell is the artist who does these things. If you're someone who likes to write about natural history, consider writing 800 words and sending it into the editors of Northern Woodlands. And they have a series that comes out called The Outside Story. It shows up in all the newspapers around the place. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not a great, rich, quick scheme by any means, but um, it's, it's a nice way to share the, the stuff that you're passionate about. And then you'll get a beautiful piece of art done by Adelaide to go with the piece that you've written, which is kind of fun. And that's the most exciting part for me. When it comes out in the newspaper, I want to see what, what, art, what the art looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then Adelaide was willing to share it all in the book. So um, I came to the country in 87, and I've been here ever since. I've done the tour of Vermont at Fort Middlebury, and I've been in St. Mike's since 2001. And uh, that's, that's where I come from. So uh, the reason I started wanting to put the book together was because I get questions like this. How do I get rid of these in the top of my pool? Okay? And this message was sent to me by a colleague who I've, I've blocked out. And I replied back and I said, well, you don't really want to get rid of them. They're, they're fine. But if you really want to, you can have this guy. And, uh, and here's the reply. No, 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 no. And then this question. Okay, how can people like creatures of my pond? They can swim, they can fly. Could there be water about them? You know, and I replied to my sister, and I said, you know, if your brother was an aquatic entomologist, you could ask him these questions. <laughs> so there's a lot of misinformation out there, and there's a lot of people who are freaked out by bugs. And uh, so a lot of the things in the book, um, despite what the like loon on the cover, there is an essay about loons in there, but um, uh, the, the, a lot of it is about the aquatic insects that are there. And it all happens because of the strange characteristics of water. So if you've ever had a drink of anything with an ice cube in it, the ice cube hopefully didn't sink, right? And so that's a strange characteristic of water. Most other things are going to freeze from the bottom up. So if you've ever made candles and you leave the candle wax molten, it's not going to start freezing across the top, it'll freeze in the bottom. But water doesn't do that. And so that's one of the cool things about water, and uh, I would argue it makes life possible. So under the ice, the temperature is pretty well constant. So things that are under ice can evolve to that constant temperature. And again, this is just because of the physics of water. And you've got a little bit of cold water close to the surface, but everything else below that is, you know, 39 degrees Fahrenheit, be like Fahrenheit, 4 degrees Celsius. So it's really constant temperature for a long way. And so I, I would say that allows life to be possible. How did we get here without all of these things evolving in water? And of course, it also allows for ice fishing, which is kind of a fun thing to think about. And, and the reason I put this up here is uh, because a lot of people think, well, yeah, things are frozen in the winter, nothing's happening. But ask anyone who's gone ice fishing, it isn't just to get out of the house. You do actually catch things that you can eat. So clearly things are in there, they're moving, they're eating, otherwise you wouldn't catch them. So there's lots of life happening under the ice. So, uh, other, one, other thing about water is it stores energy. It takes a lot of energy to heat water up, and therefore it is stored for a long time and released. So all of the, the heating of the water down here goes across the Atlantic, and where I come from then, gets warmed up by that. At the same, other, same latitude as Edmonton, and um, we don't freeze, you know, hardly ever, and hardly any snow over there. So interesting things. Uh, people close to Lake Champlain have a warmer climate and longer growing seasons, and people just a little bit away from the lake. You know, between Westford and Burlington, you extend the growing season a week at each end. You know, just at some of its elevation, but a lot of it is distance in the lake. So surface tension is important. So uh, you know. It can be good for some things, bad for other things. A lot of things treat this as their spider web. And I'll show you some examples. So this is one, um, this, is the, this is the fishing spider. They hardly ever fish these. Sometimes they catch a fish, but that's what they call them. We were doing a program right down here uh, in, what was it July or June maybe? And it was a whole bunch of groups of families would rotate through the various stations. And I spent, it was supposed to wrap up at 2.30 or 3 o'clock, I forget exactly when. But some family came right at the end. And we've been hopping in and out of the river for the whole day. 
And at the very end, this little kid really wanted to do something. So I said, all right, let's go get some bugs. We did it. And I said, well, you've got to help me team up at the end. So we stayed a few minutes later. Andy was happy. And just as this kid was getting out, he put his foot in the riverbank. And the riverbank collapsed a little bit. And out swam a fishing spider that we had been stepping over the whole day. Yeah. And it just sat there, totally unperturbed by us. And that was the only family that got to see a fishing spider, which was kind of fun. But they walk in the water, and they hang out with usually a pair of legs at the back. And these legs at the front are listening, feeling for vibrations across the surface. And if something falls in uh, from a tree branch or whatever, it'll run out and grab it and come back in again. And then when, when the breeding season comes, and the males come onto the water surface, they drum on the water surface with a specific rhythm. And if they do the rhythm just right, um, the female might be happy with that. And if they get it wrong, they might become lunch. So it's, uh, they're, they're cool little beasties. Obviously, this is the sixth spot. Fishing spider, because look, there's one, two, three, four, hang on, five, six, seven, eight. It's called a six spot fishing spider because some entomologists turn it upside down and count the six spots on the bottom. And only two people get to see the bottom, and that would be an entomologist or its prey item. <laughs> But that's the way it got named anyway. But they're cool looking beasties, very common. Uh, water striders, this is sort of my vision of a pond from a kid, from, from being a kid. You always see the you see the, 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 the dimples before you see the bug. Or even more often you'll see the shadow of the dimples. But they cast a really huge shadow. And uh, they really push down on the water surface. And this is what their legs look like up close and personal. And all of these hairs are hydrophobic. And uh, there's cool studies done on this. Uh, it seems like the Chinese scientists really like this stuff. And there's a whole bunch of papers in China looking at how much weight that leg can support. And they can, they can, they can support something like nine times their own body weight on those legs. So you've probably seen more spiders, uh, but you might not have realized that they can fly. And so what they can do is they take those long legs and they, it's been, they basically clap them together and it ejects them straight up and then they can take off and fly to another place if the conditions aren't right. So they're, they're kind of fun. We've done stuff with them with students where we can mark them with a little bit of whiteout. And nobody uses whiteout for typing anymore, but people like me still use it for marking bugs. And you can still buy it. <laughs> and you can find out where they're in. They're pretty faithful to the pool you put them back in. The other one you might have seen is whirligate beetles. And uh, they zoom around in surfaces like in circles, they look like a little motorboat that lost its, its, its rubber and it's going in random directions. And there's so many of them moving that it would be hard to pick one off. They also are quite distasteful. And um, so if a bird does eat one, it's only going to eat one. It's not going to go for a second one. Which is true for um, the ladybugs that might infest your house too. Have you ever taste one? <laughs> Have you ever taste one? I do this with 17-year-old with students. And there's, 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 you know, let's say 35 students, I say, Who's tasted the lady, ladybug? And, and a hat, there's always at least one hand that goes up. And you don't want to guess the gender? It's almost always a guy. <laughs> but in every class, there's someone who's tasted. I said, did you ever have a second one? I'm like, no. One time only. Same with these things. They're really, really distasteful. Um, cool thing about these, uh, I have a student, and there's an essay about this in the book. I have a student working with me. And she's looking at down a microscope and she says, what's this bug with four eyes? And without even looking at it, I tell her, that's a whirligig beetle. And she says, yeah, really? What's the real name? But if you look at them from the side, they have eyes that point down, they've got eyes that point up. And again, Chinese scientists have looked at the optical properties of the surfaces of these eyes. And the ones that look down are optimized for working through water. And the ones that look up are optimized for looking through to the air. It's really incredible adaptation. And then the other cool thing, which in common with everything from seagulls to fish, is they have the counter shade. So the top surface is black. You look at them from above, and they're camouflaged against the lake floor or the pond floor. You look at them from below, they're somewhat camouflaged against the sky. So a whole bunch of things have that same counter shade. And the only one that flips it that I know about is the, um, the backstromer because the backstromer swims upside down and its belly is, is, is the dark side and its back is the pale side. So it's a really cool adaptation. So you gotta love how these things evolve. Another thing that uses surface tension, um, these are mosquito larvae and they have a siphon. So this is like a snorkel and they push it up to the surface. It has a series of branches that open up and uh, it, can, it hangs from the water surface. And uh, not only the larvae, but the pupae do that also. 
And for some of the species, they'll lay a raft of eggs like this. And the scale here is like three or four millimeters, so you know, quarter inch-ish, little raft of eggs. So if you have mosquitoes bothering you in your fish pond or in your bird, bird bath or whatever you might have in your yard, um, all you need is a little bit of uh, like a bubbler or a fountain or something that ruffles the surface and it will disrupt your life cycle. So you don't, have to, you don't have to get rid of your pond, you just put a fountain in and you can get solar fountains that operate during daylight. Mm -hmm. And you just make enough splash that you're not, you, you won't have mosquitoes. But easier way to get rid of mosquitoes, the, the adults also walk, walk on water. They, they hatch out of the pupil skin, there's the pupil left behind, they hatch out, they crawl along the surface, they can fly immediately. They're incredible animals, really. I mean, nobody loves them, I guess, but um, <laughs> what can you do? But uh, this, is the, this is the way to get rid of your mosquitoes. Clean your gutters. Clean your gutters. That is a linear pond really close to mosquito food, which would be you or me. So uh, I get tired of cleaning the gutters. And I, last time I got the gutters replaced, I said, do you, do you do that gutter guard stuff? And he did the gutter guard, and I haven't cleaned them since. So uh, that never makes you happy. And the other, last thing I'll say about gutters, um, you can have the, the downspout from your gutter go from any part of the house. So it can be at the corner, but it doesn't have to be. I learned this from our gutter installer guy, because I didn't want the water going to the driveway. I wanted it going out onto the grass. Mm -hmm. And that reduces erosion downstream. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, yeah, I can put it from the middle of the run and right out onto your lawn, it's fine. And so that's what that, my gutters. Drew to the center, down the downspout, out onto the lawn, and I've saved that quantity of water. And if we all did a little bit of that, you know, eventually we reduce the erosion. So, so far I'm talking about uh, life on top. So that's one section of the book is about things that live on top. And uh, the next section of the book is about life in flowing water. I forget the order, it might not be in that order. <laughs> Sounds like a wrote thing. No, uh, it's, like, it, it's in a, it's in a it, there's standing water, there's, uh, there's flowing water, there's things that emerge from the water. There's a whole bunch of different sections. But you can jump in at any order you like. You find a message you want to read next, that's the one to read next. And um, move the bookmark around the place. And they're, they're 800 words a piece or so. So, uh, hey, anyway, flowing water. Very, very oxygenated. Uh, it's constantly flushing and eroding. So, in a clean stream like the one we have up here, you should expect there to be clean rocks perched on top of other rocks. And all the nooks and crannies in between are habitat. If you go to Oh, Centennial Brook in Burlington, which drains a whole bunch of, uh, like an airport runway, and a whole bunch of parking lots at a hotel and university, right? All of those parking lots are contributing rainwater, and therefore contributing erosion, and therefore this, the, 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 the creek is so full of sediment that if you pull a rock out of, the, out of the sediment, you'll see a bathtub rain. And that's not the natural state for a river. So that's how you can tell if you're in a very clean river, or a river that needs help. UVM put in a series of ponds in collaboration with the hotel, and they actually have improved conditions in that creek. And there's actually been some insects that have returned um, in the five or 10 years since that, that has happened. So you can actually see the improvement in terms of bugs actually coming back and recolonizing. So you can, you can make a difference. And um, lots of food gets delivered, which is great. Door-to-door -door delivery of your food is nice, right? But there's also the risk of getting washed down the stream. And the things in the stream have evolved for that not to happen. And the, the insect I had up there at the beginning is very much like that. It's very, very flat. It was a water penny beetle. And it stays inside that zone that is just low friction, very, very little, uh, sorry, high friction, very, very little water flow. There's so much friction with the rock that the water the water's not flowing fast. So that's called a boundary layer. And a whole bunch of things live in that boundary layer. And so it's more things. So there's a nice Swinuski picture for you. So uh, we do get some floods once in a while. Um, more than we used to, and um, the hundred-year flood lines that were were put on the maps by FEMA were put on there in you know before the 1970s, based on 30, 40, 50 years of data before then. And uh, last year we had the big July flood. This year we had the big July flood. Most a lot of people missed the December flood we had last year. All three of those floods would have been considered 100-year floods. So we're getting more rainfall than we used to, and we're getting bigger floods than we used to. In most aquatic places, most ponds, most lakes, most streams, the base of the food web falls in during leaf keeper season. So all those buses of folks come up to see the leaves, and they go home again, and that's when leaf season starts in the river. Okay? So food comes in, 
it's, it's inedible. So no leaf evolved to provide food for anything. So the leaves are very strongly defended against herbivores. They're full of toxins and, and all sorts of nasty things. Caffeine, for example, is one of the things that evolved against the insects, and, and nicotine's another one. But think about an oak leaf. It's like a strip of leather, and it's full of lignin. It's full of, it's full of, of stuff that makes it hard to digest. And so when it falls in, some of those compounds have to leach away before it becomes edible. So you also have to get bacterial and fungal colonization. Here's the cool part, though. If you have a diverse forest like we have along the banks here, you have things like basswood that fall in and they're a really tender leaf that's ready to eat in a week or two. Okay, and it comes early. Later in the season, you get the maples coming. And even later than that, when you're finished doing all your raking with the maples, the oaks kind of watch you and wait till you're finished, and then they drop their leaves, right? So you have a sequence of leaves getting falling in, and the, the oaks take forever to become edible. So you've got a whole supply, because of the diversity of trees in the, in the basin, you've got a whole diversity of, of availability and timing of when the food is edible. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Which is cool. So you want a diverse forest, so you can have a diverse, diverse um, insect community in the stream. And the people who like to fish, does anyone like to fish? Something like one person, all right. Uh, okay, I got a little. Um, have you ever taken a leaf and put it on a hook to catch the fish? <laughs> no, it doesn't work, right? <laughs> the insects eat the leaves, and you can put an insect on a hook and you might catch a fish, but you're not going to do any luck with uh, a leaf. So we need the insects in between. That's uh, sort of my, 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 my plea for the, for the insects, I guess. So uh, we call them shredders, they're shredding the leaves, and there's a whole bunch of them. So these are stone flies. And you can get this particular stonefly right out here. And uh, I'm not going to give you all that analogy of this, but they're stoneflies. And this is a, a, a true fly. So true flies don't have legs. So if you've ever seen a maggot, that becomes a true fly. And the adults are the ones that have the two wings. Most of the things that land on you will bite you other than ticks. Most of the things like mosquitoes, deer flies, horse flies. Most of those are dipterans, true flies. So, uh, but they have an important role in breaking down the leaves. So uh, we run a nature area uh, on campus at St. Mike's. And uh, because we have trails, it got put into all trails. And then people will review your trail. And we weren't looking for reviews. But they reviewed our trail, and they said they didn't like the bugs. <laughs> what, what would St. Mike's do about the bugs? And I'm like, we're hoping for bugs. <laughs> it's a natural area. <laughs> you know? But um, yeah, and I will say, in, in, in uh, late June, early July, the deer flies are pretty bad. But um, we've done a cool experiment. A high school group asked me if I would run an activity that demonstrated experimental design to a bunch of high school students. And it had to be somehow medically relevant. And I was like, okay. So here's what I did. I got them all identical purple hats with nice St. Mike's logos on them. And on the back, I put deer fly patches. And deer fly patches are gently sticky on one side so it doesn't destroy your clothing and aggressively sticky on the other side. So when deer flies land, they stick to your hat. Sound good so far? <laughs> and we went for a three mile hike. Half of the students I assigned a dragonfly on a wire. Right, so this plastic dragonfly, every time you move your head a little bit, things orbiting your head. And what I found is the students, if they got assigned a dragonfly, they were not giving that up for anybody. They were, they were excited about it. So like, okay. So then we, we sent them off, we had a three mile hike, we had a good time, talked about some things around the way, came back and we took off all the hats and put them in a row, and we counted the deer flies. And the deer flies avoided those plastic dragonflies like you wouldn't believe. So, another way to keep the deer flies away from you without <laughs> putting a sticky, nasty thing in your hat is a little dragonfly. So, kind of fun. Anyway, things that make me happy. <laughs> so, uh, other stuff, um, lots of particles are in the water. So if you're in an urban area, there's eroded particles in the landscape. If you're in a farm area, there's eroded land. There's, there's cow manure. There's different things ending up as particles in the water. And there's things that are, are filtering this out. And we get insect poop, which we call frass. Why do we call it frass? Uh, just because, I guess. But anyway, uh, everybody poops, as they say. And here's one of the things that is collecting that poop, OK? And this is how they're doing. This is a black fly. And I'll tell you a short black fly story, and I'm going to read it out of the book, and I'm going to tell you the short version. Um, it, they solved a murder case in, in, uh, in Michigan. So this, this um, woman disappeared, 
And her husband said, oh, she's fine. She walked out, we had a big fight. But I have been in touch, and I heard from her in January, and I heard from her in December, and her friend saw her in March. And the scuba divers found her in April. And she was in the car, upside down in the creek. And they scraped the windshield of the car, and they took off all the insects they could find, and they sent them off to an entomologist and said, what can you tell us about how long this car has been in the river? And the black flies provided evidence because they had made these pupil cases out of silk. Black flies were gone, but the cases were left behind. And he said, those are only laid down in September. That car has been in the river since September. And so, yeah, we call that what we, we call that I say, life, death, and black flies. <laughs> and the, the research was done by uh, Rich Merritt. He's the entomologist they sent the stuff off to. And so when I was trying to figure out who would be a nice person to write about the uh, write something for the cover of the book. I thought, Rich would be good. And I got a whole bunch of essays and I put his one on top. And I sent them off and said, what do you think? So he, <laughs> he, he wrote a blurb. And uh, he, his name probably means nothing to, to most people, but in my world, um, he's, he's this guy. <laughs> and uh, I was thrilled to get him to write a blurb for the book. And um, you know, he was super generous about it. And uh, if you decide to really get into this kind of stuff, this is what you need for identifying just the insects. There's another one that's as thick for the snails and everything else. But let's say you want to go out tomorrow with um, some school students or some grandchildren or just for fun. You can start off with something like this. And you can download 20 di different versions of this online. Just Google macro invertebrate identification sheet. This one is from the Isaac Walton League, but there's many of these published. So there's your starting point. You don't need that unless you decide to be a professional. So, you need fancy tools as well, of course. And my favorite thing is a catheter tray. Very important tool. Um, I like to have a sieve. And you can get the $50 brass sieve, or you can get this thing from Joanne's Fabrics and put a bit of plastic window screen in there. You want to avoid the metal window screen because it's scratchy. And you'll, have, you'll be cutting yourself. Um, for working with little kids, uh, dollar store, you get six of them, in, you know, zip tied together for about four bucks, and you've got yourself your, your macro invertebrate zoo, I like to call it. Keep it in the shade, you know, a little bit of water in each one. And if that was there's water in there, they'll stay in for a little bit, and then you can liberate them at the end of the day. So, all the fancy gear. Um, I did a program down in um, New Hampshire, and I got there, and I, I realized they had no projector or anything else, and I was like, oh, what am I going to do now? So I went to the dollar store and I bought all of those things. I went to the pharmacy and I got tweezers in the, in the, the eyebrow area. You can get tweezers. <laughs> and I got this in the dollar store. That's all you really need. You don't need a whole lot of fancy equipment. You know? And if you're working in ponds, get a bucket, pour the water through something like this, or get a, get a pair of nylon stockings. It's a finer mesh, and you'll get all the water fleas. So you don't need a lot of gear. If you decide to do it long term, this device is, is sort of the, the basic tool. And you know, it's probably 140, 150 bucks, but it's a really good net. And um, I, before I got to St. Mike's, Dan Bean purchased all of these. They're certainly older than all of my students, and they're probably older than me, because Dan was there in the 1960s and 70s, and he, he, he retired right before I got there. So that'll last you forever. And eventually the, the bag will wear out and you just replace the bag. So if you're going to do it long term, you know, we have a dozen of these at work and we use them all the time. All right. Caddis flies, there's, there's lots of different caddis flies. One of them is on the TV right behind you. It's, it, 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 some of them make like a little rocky case. So all of those rocks you see there are in fact assembled and tied together by silk by these caddis flies. This one doesn't make a case, it makes a net instead. So there he is. Smile here on camera. And uh, each of these little things is a caddis fly net. Each of these rectangles is a different type of caddis fly. And if you get really close into one of these nets, it looks like this. So they spin these little nets. And if you pick a rock out of the river and something stuck to it, it didn't stick by accident. Things don't just stick to rocks. There's too much erosion in the stream for that to be, to be true. So you're almost certainly finding an insect if there's something stuck to the rock. So when I want to go today and get some rocks for some some rocks, some insects for, for, for this evening, I just stepped into Lake Champlain, kicked a few rocks, without even knocking them, just kicked them into the net and brought them on over. All of this rocky surface you see here, it's all caddis flies, wall to wall. 
dozens of them. So, lots of, lots of cool things. Uh, we had this fellow on screen earlier, that's the water penny. So if it wants to avoid being washed away, it will stay flat and be in that boundary there. Underneath they have their gills. And uh, I think I mentioned to some people who came in early, they were first described by biologists as a crustacean. So they thought they were like isopods or, you know, wood lice, for example. But in fact, they have six legs. And it's even in the description. Legs, three pairs. And so we, we, I wrote a little bit about that as well. They're, they're fun little beasties. But the adult only lasts for three or four days. And I was doing this stuff for 20 years before I ever saw an adult. So we can forgive the folks who originally described it. Right? <laughs> so, uh, this is a false order penny, very similar, but it's got this like bread knife, sawtooth edge, and long gills. But you get them around here as well. And this is the one that's on the screen in the back. It's called Neophylax, and it has these big stones on the side. They call them ballast stones, and they keep it from washing away also. And if you want, if you raise some of those in uh, some nice, you know, semi precious stones, you can have them assemble a little earring for you. And if you get online tonight in your spare time and Google caddisfly earrings, you too can be the last of the true romantics and, and buy, buy caddisfly earrings for the person you love. And, and you'll find out whether they like insects or not, whether you still have a relationship to these other. <laughs> so, but there is, there is a, there's a couple of folks in West Virginia who are actually doing this and they raise them in semi-precious stones. Yeah, it's kind of fun, isn't it? Uh, they and they stay that way? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, inside yeah. The rocks. They stay inside the rocks, and then when they become adults, they come out, and the case is left behind. Oh, so, okay. I did. This is one of the things that got me hooked. This is like my science fair project when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I was like twelve, raising caddisflies, and I threw the matchsticks, and they put the matchsticks into the cases as well. Mm -hmm. And I had them tacked up to a, like a. This is before I had access to a computer or a printer or any of that. So I had this handwritten poster I made for my science fair project with caddisfly cases taped onto it. So, uh, yeah, that's anyway, amazing. that's fun stuff, you know. How uh, durable are they? They're pretty durable. And then if you add a bit of resin, of course, they become indestructible. But yeah, they're, they're actually pretty durable. And we have had a few students who are, yeah, we have, I took a group of, I used to do a, a, a course for the education majors. And the education majors have their major in education and like another major in something else. And a couple of them were art students. And I took them out to a river to do this kind of stuff. And once they found the first Caddisfly case, I couldn't get them to look for anything else. Mm -hmm. They wanted to find a matching one so they could, <laughs> they could, they could make some art. Anyway. So, yeah. That's amazing. They're cool, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Caddisflies are my favorite, right? You know, no shame in having a favorite bug, right? <laughs> People can have favorite birds. Why not a favorite bug? So, anyway, that's running water. Standing water, right? It's not still water, but it's not going in one direction, right? So, standing water. And, you know, this is obviously a very, very active storm happening here. Anyone who's been out on a boat in a storm knows that standing water is not still water. So, but still, it, it, it's not unidirectional. So you get a different set of organisms and a different set of problems, okay? More depositional. So when a river flows in, it's deposited, the water velocity now slows down. And all of that stuff that was churned around in the current is going to get dropped in the lake. And that's where we get tides. <coughs> And where I work, we're on what used to be the Winooski Delta. And of course, the ice had pushed the earth down into the, into the earth's crust. And we were below sea level at one point. And so the delta was forming. And then as we recovered, as the ice went away, that delta material came up above ground, so to speak, above water, I should say. And so Essex Junction, Winooski, South Burlington, all those areas are on the buildup of the Winooski Delta. And I don't know if you know the geography of, the, of that area, but that's where my brain goes when I think about it. Anyway, uh, because of all of this deposition, oxygen gets used up and you get layers. And this is, uh, this is uh, I was going to say it's sediment, but it isn't sediment. This is actually ice. We'll talk about sediment in a second. <laughs> anyway, you get the water layers. Uh, any, any scuba divers? Anyone gone scuba diving? Okay, who's gone swimming in a lake? Has anyone ever told you that if you walk out just a little farther, there's a spring? Have you anyone heard that story? Mm -hmm. I've heard that story in Arrowhead Lake in Pennsylvania. I've heard it in Lockery in Ireland, and I've heard it in, uh, at uh, North Beach. That you go out there, you'll feel the cold water in the spring. And like, it would be a big coincidence for all those places to have a spring, <laughs> and they don't. <laughs> and what they have is cold water circulating low and warm water circulating above. 
and this rapid change in between. And if you go, if you take a scuba diving course in a lake, they'll take you to the thermocline and they'll have you practice what's called uh, neutral buoyancy. You don't want to be sinking, you don't want to be going up like a cork. And they want you to master that because it's, 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 it, you save your oxygen ultimately and because you're not wasting energy trying to fight, the, fight your buoyancy. So they want you to be neutrally buoyant. And if they're a good instructor, they'll take you to the thermocline and they'll have you be vertical. And you'll feel it. You'll feel how cold it is from here down and the contrast from here up. It's, it's remarkable. It's, it's really very, very stark. And then what they have to do is take you down below the thermocline and take your mask off so you feel that rush of cold water and put it on. Question? Or are we doing, running out of time? No. We're all good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll wrap it up in a few minutes. Whatever. You know, if there's questions, interrupt me too. I, I, I love questions. Anyway, that's summertime in a typical lake around here. Um, life is, is consumed rapidly. And uh, the cool thing is the blue light goes the farthest through water. That's why if you see a lagoon that has white sand at the bottom, it'll look like a blue lagoon. It's kind of cold. So it's just physics. But then if you've got particles in the water, they're going to absorb light as well. So you run out of light pretty fast. And the algae are going to grow most rapidly at the surface. And then the heat is going to be consumed closest to the surface. So this is warm, this is cold. So that's, that's, that's just the extra. Right? And in the fall, something cool happens. And the water at the top, at some point, gets colder than the water below. And if it's colder, it will be denser. And that causes it to sink. And when it sinks, it turns over. And the whole lake can literally turn over. And that brings oxygen down, which is important in, in like a lot of Adir Adirondack lakes, for example. Without that turnover, they could never have trout. But they need to get the oxygen down deep. It brings nutrients up. In a normal lake, that would be wonderful. But if we polluted the lake, we have this endless cycle of phosphorus being brought back up. So all of the phosphorus that we paid farmers to put on the land in the 1970s, we literally paid them. There was, a, there was literally a program. We're going to pay you to put phosphorus on your land. That phosphorus is still washing into the lake. And so we have legacy phosphorus. And so to plan for a cleaner lake champagne, we have to plan decades. We have to think about our grandchildren having a cleaner lake. We can't, your grandchildren, I mean, not my grandchildren. We have to think about your grandchildren having a cleaner lake. You won't have a cleaner lake. <laughs> so I'm saying, you won't have a cleaner lake. But your grandchildren might. That's what we have to plan for. It has to be a long-term thing. And a lot of voters and taxpayers are not happy with that. They want to fix faster. It's not going to happen. It's too much phosphorus in the landscape. So, anyway. And the, and the algae... When that yeah. process is happening, what happens with that? Well, uh, because the nutrients are brought up, the following summer the algae will thrive on that phosphorus. And so you get your algal blooms, usually in Vermont you get them in, um, in August and September. Yeah. And, but you can get them earlier and they are starting earlier as it like, warms faster. So, yeah, so you brought that nutrient back up to feed the algae. Right. Which sounds great, more algae, more oxygen. <coughs> but what happens when the lights go out? So every night, Lights go out and all those algal cells are not consuming oxygen. And so that's one time that fish can get killed. And the other time that fish can get killed is when there's, this is really bizarre. It's a little bit of chemistry, but it's, it's important. The algae are so productive in the middle of the day that they hyper oxygenate the water and they also pull all of the carbon dioxide out of the water. And carbon dioxide in water makes carbonic acid. If you pull all the carbon dioxide out of the water, the water becomes alkaline. And that can kill the fish as well. So you can get a fish kill at night time, you can get a fish kill in the middle of the day. So yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really a nasty problem. And the shallow bays in particular, like uh, Missisco Bay, very shallow, uniformly shallow across the whole area. Really difficult, uh, really almost intractable. Anyway, what do you do? We're trying to talk about some more cheerful stuff. <laughs> so I will skip that. Um, you want to you hear about the ice? Mm -hmm. And the main thing to get here is that water is most dense at these temperatures. So at, at 39 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when water is densest. And that's why you can reliably have this temperature of water, even in a lake that's 300 feet deep. There'll be a little bit of cold water close to the ice, but the rest of it is this temperature. And this is great. The, uh, the, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the fish. What's the fish we all try and fish for through the ice? That's kind of sweet. Perch. Perch, yeah, perch is a good one, but there's one that's... Um, 
that you only catch in the winter time. The long thin one. The long thin one, yeah. Um, the name will come to me eventually. It fills its tissues up with glycol and it's really sweet to taste. And you don't get it in the middle of uh, the name doesn't escape when you can bleed it. Oh well. Um, but anyway, hmm? is it pipe? It's not pipe, no, it's, it's smaller. <laughs> and to get them in the ocean Small also. Pipe. Small pipe. Small pipe, I like that. <laughs> okay, it'll come to me when I least, it'll come to me after you've all left. Anyway, in, in the summertime they're still in the lake, but they're down below that thermocline. They're down where it's still cold enough to keep them happy. So, anyway. <laughs> I should have put the name on the slide. This is what, I, what I'm teaching. If there's something that I reliably forget, I put it on the slide. <laughs> So that's my cheat right there. All right, so uh, until recently, we thought, ecologists thought that there wasn't much happening under the ice. And I'm gonna finish up on under the ice. This is, this is fun stuff. And so I wrote about this beast here. This is a phantom mage. And I wrote about the phantom mage because I just thought the name was cool and they look cool. And they have these buoyancy things here. These are like air bubbles inside mm -hmm. their body that allows them to float. And they have some of the biggest daily migrations of anything. They migrate from the bottom of the lake to the surface and back down again on a 24-hour cycle. Even if the lake is 300 feet deep, they're incredible. And so I wrote all about that, and I was really excited about it. I interviewed Jason Stockwell about it. And Jason had sent his students out to Shelburne Pond in uh, February and March. And they drilled holes in the ice, and they started pumping from different depths to figure out where these things were, and were they migrating in the wintertime. And if you asked anyone four years ago, do these things migrate in the winter? People would have said, nah, probably not. But Jason discovered that they do migrate under the ice in the winter. And so the reason they migrate is because fish are visual predators. And if they see this thing in the water in the daytime when they, when they can see with the light, they're going to eat them. And so they migrate down into the muck for the day. But they're hungry down there because all the bugs that they want to eat are up higher. So they're eating smaller things. They're eating these water fleas that I have here. I'll show you water flea in a minute. And the water fleas are up top. And they're so small the fish don't bother with them. So this thing has to come back up and get the water fleas. So just that when it's dark. Great. Right? So I wrote this all up and I was very excited about it. And um, Megan McCarthy McFall is the other editor who works at Northern Woodlands. She said, how do they do it? I know why they do it. Tell me how they do it. How did they do that migration? And I gave her a textbook answer that I learned, you know, 25 years ago. Nobody knows. <laughs> and, uh, That's an answer. Yeah, and then I thought, well, maybe somebody knows. And so I went into Google Scholar, and I thought, you know, put in phantom mage, buoyancy, blah, 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 blah. It had been discovered three months earlier, and published three months earlier, how they do it. And how they do it is they change the pH of their fluids around that bubble, OK? And um, it, it causes the bubble to contract, right? When the pH is in a certain range, which causes the, the density to increase and the thing sinks. And when they need to come back, they just reverse the pH. So they've changed the, the acid-base relationship. The bubble expands and they come up like a cork. And that was, that was published literally, you know, three months before I started writing about it. So I, I was like, oh, Megan, now we know. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, people like me at a small college, we, we do a certain amount of research. But a lot of what I do is I, I'm interpreting stuff and I'm explaining it for students. And I did, this is why I get into what I'm doing. And uh, it's been a whole lot of fun. And I've had a whole lot of help from a whole lot of people. And I want to just put that side up and then I'll stop. Because um, I, I, I forgot to mention it. all the other people who have helped me out here. And the biggest thank you is to, is to, um, to uh, the um, folks at, um, maybe I didn't put it on there, oh there it is, yeah, at the magazine. So, um, I, you know, I, I write what I write, but the editors are extremely generous with their time, and they fix the mistakes I've made, and if there's too much jargon, that's the big thing, I'm like, no, 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 no. We don't want to hear about the food chain, that sounds like Arby's. Why did you put that in a different way? I was like, okay, because I'm too close to this stuff, and the words that I think are just commonplace, they're not always commonplace. So the editors were amazing. So I really have to send out a lot of praise. And they're funded by these folks, the Wilburn Ecology um, Fund in New Hampshire. And the Lintelac Foundation funds them also. And most of my work for a dozen years of funded by Vermont Depth School, working with a whole bunch of high schools from Vermont and New York and Puerto Rico and all sorts of places. And I, I, all of the folks at St. Mike's listen patiently when I tell them the next story that I'm excited about. 
And uh, I, I really appreciate that. And the students as well. The reason I, I, I get to do what I do is because of folks like you. Thank you, and thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, and my family uh, have been really nice to come out as well. So, and I would like to do a shout out to independent bookstores. So, thank you. Um, yeah, seriously. Um, it's, it's cool. You walk into a certain chain that will remain nameless, and you get all the best sellers, right? But you walk into one independent bookstore or a different one, and you get a curated set of books. They have taken the time, they're excited about books, and they have put together a collection that they think you'll be interested in. And they get to know the folks in their area, and they know what will be interesting to the folks in there. So I, I, I've, had, I've really been uh, wonderfully hosted by a bunch of independent booksellers, and I thank you. And Sean, thank you for organizing tonight. So. And I, I, I'll answer questions if you've got questions. You've got a book to show us. Right? Oh, I've got all sorts of books to show you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. thanks. I would have forgotten. <laughs> so, let me get this plumbing correct here. There we go. Can we ask you questions meanwhile? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When are you doing the audiobook narration? It seems like you have the voice for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told I have a funny accent. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, they, they haven't asked for an audiobook. Um, it was in the contract that, that they reserved the right to have an audiobook. And I emailed them at some point and said, yeah, I'll do an audiobook, you know, whatever. Because they usually pay somebody with, with the voice, you know. <laughs> Let me tell you about the kind of slides. But I did offer to do it, um, haven't heard back. Um, but if you want some of that, I got the podcast. <laughs> Nature Stippers podcast, yeah. I have a question. Of course, science changes all the time, yeah. so there are new things. I want to know the test that I was hired to do. 40 years ago is still being used. I was an aquatic biologist with the state of Connecticut. Oh, wow, One cool. of my early jobs yeah. was looking at the teeth of the hydrocyclic, hydrocyclic dentation yeah. to determine whether the water quality was, what the water quality was. Is yeah. that still a water quality test? It is still a water quality test, yeah. And not just hydrocycles, but also chironomids. Oh, so yeah. hydrocycles are, are a caddis fly, caddis fly, and they have dentition that you can look at. And they count their teeth. They count their teeth. And if, you have, um, to, if you've got inferior water quality, the chemicals can mess up the way that their cells divide, mm -hmm. and you can literally lose teeth. That's still being used. That's still being used, yeah. More commonly with midges than with, with caddis flies these days. But yeah, it's still been used. So yeah, the technique you, you, you learned, still the real deal. <laughs> yeah. And the, the other thing, the, the more common thing, is looking at the diversity. So how many species do you oh, have? We did that too. Yeah. There many yeah. tests. But yeah. Yeah. Sure yeah. yeah. No, they're still doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. And I always tell the students, you know, there's 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 job security in these things. And some things you can do with molecular techniques, and that's great. But you still sometimes need somebody looking at a microscope to uh, to identify what you've got. And uh, in you every. You're finding wild with the tester and turn over rocks and collect them. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's that's I, that's my favorite part. Problem is, you spend a day or two turning over the rocks, right? Turning the stones, like the book title, and you get the bugs, and then it's many weeks, you know, in, in the lab. So I don't emphasize that part of the students too much. Anymore. Come work for me in the summer, we'll do field work. Yeah. So, yeah. Penny is going He's migrating. <laughs> Let's see what else we have. Must be hot. Right? Yeah, well, yeah, they're LEDs, so it's not as bad as it would have been. This is a kind of a cool one. Oh. So it, it might look like a snail, but um, you probably know what this is. <laughs> it, it's also a kind of slide. So it's taken sand grains and uh, spliced them together with soap to make its case. Mm -hmm. And when this one was first described, it was described just from the case. And it was described by a snail biologist who said it was a unique North American snail <laughs> that had somehow incorporated sand into its case. And then the, the entomologists were like, so much. <laughs> I have them where um, they have little black chips in there, and you put the forceps into the sample, and out come the caddis flies. Mm. It turns out they were incorporating magnetite into their cases. Mm. I don't know if there was any reason for that other than there was magnetite there, but they were literally sticking to my forceps. It's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, different species um, reliably use different types of substrate, or is it also opportunistic where they'll use what they have if they don't have it? Um, they're, they're pretty faithful to their materials. So there are some that are strictly sand grains, and the one on the screen at the back always has two big rocks near, near the opening of its case, and one at the back end 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's sand grains and then it's pebbles. And then there's some that, that are strictly sticks or some that are leaves. One of my favorites is called Pycnocyche gentilis. Early in the season, it uses leaves, it cuts little discs of leaf. And as the season progresses and as it gets bigger, um, eventually it transitions to uh, sand and gravel. And sometimes you'll find one that has leaves on the back end and sand and gravel in front end. <laughs> So, yeah. Does it function like a chrysalis? Is it because you said it was protecting the yeah. young? Uh, so they stay in there and develop? And yeah, so this thing will crawl around with its case like that from yeah. rock to rock, grazing algae, and mm -hmm. the case goes with it. Some of the more linear ones, it's like a sleeping bag and they're lined entirely with silk. And the other cool thing is they wriggle their bodies to move water through the case. So it also functions to move fresh water over their gills. So it's protective, it helps them oxygenate, you know, it camouflages them. And if, if a bird wants to eat this, it has to eat the insect and all this crab as well, so it might be less, less appetizing. <laughs> and then some of them uh, eventually will fasten it to a rock and they'll pupate right inside it. So, yeah, it does all of those things. So how long is it in that phase? Um, most of the site in that phase. So this would be an annual life cycle for this one, so full, almost a full year, oh. and then the adult hatches out and flies around oh. and, uh, you know, finds love and lays the eggs back into the water. It's <laughs> <That's> remarkable. <laughs> yeah, cool little species. <laughs> so, yeah. Other questions? All right, so I, 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 if you want to find more bugs, you put more bugs in the scope, and I got a little water fee here. Uh, oh, he's vacated. Maybe I got the wrong one here. Here's the water flea. Uh, a friend of mine, Brian Swisher, raises these. So he's got a whole thing. He calls it the lake in a tube. And uh, he, he can uh, look at different soil types and water the trains through them, whether or not that causes an algal bloom. And then he put these guys in, see if they leave the algae and reverse the algal bloom. And then he can put a predator in and uh, eat these guys and bring the algal bloom back again. He's got a whole trophy cascade lab and it's been used by, by other scientists around the country as a quite a teaching tool. Those are some ten that uses the swimming. <laughs> and this one looks well fed. You can see the green that's its gut. So yeah. it's been filtering algae over the water, so it looks quite well fed. They're also used in toxicity studies. Is the water toxic? Is the sediment toxic? And they have a really fast life cycle, so you can look at reproduction. You can look in and see how many babies do they have inside before the babies emerge. Mm -hmm. And you know, so it's, uh, there's a company actually in um, in Williston called Aquatech that is, is doing this all the time. This, this is just technical. But it, how much magnification are you applying for this? That's a great question. Yeah. I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that thing is is about four or five million. That's a pretty large water flea. So it's, um, the reason I can't give you a good answer is you've got magnification and you know, maybe the lens is 40x, it probably is about 40x, and there's a zoom function. As you get closer and farther, it messes with the magnification. And then depending on the size of the screen, you know what I mean? If you were, you were outside finding some samples, yeah. Yeah. they were visible. They were visible, yeah. yeah, yeah. So these are, so that's the other thing, a macro, macro invertebrate is what I work on. Come on in, grab a chair, make yourself at home. Um, I, I'm just seeing what you've had as. All right, welcome. So macro, it means you can see it. And a lot of the way biologists define it is, I'm gonna use a sieve of 0.6 millimeters or whatever it is, does it go through the sieve? If it goes through the sieve, not part of my study. If it stays on the sieve, it's a macro inverter. So it's, it's, an, it's sort of an operational definition. And I have made the mistake of doing a study with a smaller sieve, 0.45 and I spent half of my life counting mites. <laughs> and I, I, I've never used a 0.45 sieve since then. They've been learned. <laughs> State of Vermont uses 0.6, good enough for me. Question. So is it living in that water bubble right there? It is, yeah. It yeah. can't get out. It can't get out. And if you're, gonna, if you're gonna do a microscopy with them, give them a small bubble and you keep them under your microscope. If I flood the entire thing, mm -hmm. we'll see it fleeting once in a while. So I give it a small bubble. The other advantage of small bubble of water is there's lots of surface area and lots of oxygen diffusing in. Mm -hmm. So I'll be able to get him back alive, put him back in the tube, bring him back to my colleague at the end of the day. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah. So this is just a trick to keep them handy under, under the microscope. It keeps them keeps handy. I held a little yeah. drop yeah. under the petri dish. Yeah. The downside is they, they warm up rapidly in a small drop. So um, I use LEDs, but if you were to use incandescent, that thing would have been evaporated and cooked by now. So, yeah, there's little tricks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Question? Well, there's something, two little green things that just appear. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's generating all this current, and so these small dots are algal cells. And uh, a small green thing next to the reflection, I'm not sure what that is. So, uh, yeah, yeah, often I get those students some questions, what's this thing? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you know the things you know, and you have to be confidently saying, I don't know what you know. <laughs> so, so what, do you, what is, what's happening inside it? In, inside, so um, it, there's actually an opening beneath. So mm -hmm. those, those, there's sort of, it's almost like a clamshell side by side, and uh, the, the, so it's, it's moving water through that little clamshell area for, for oxygenation. And then the, the antennae, which are the big appendages are for swimming. And um, we used to do a thing, um, remember overhead projectors? Yes. <laughs> you can take an overhead projector, turn it on its side, and it still works. And then you take a, a skinny aquarium and you put in uh, the two types of common water fleas. So there's this one, which swims up and down with his antennae, and then there's another one that has a smooth swimming motion. And you can project it across the whole room and say, okay, this is how you identify a Daphnia versus a Cyclops. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we literally make these aquariums out of uh, two sheets of plexiglass and a piece of rubber hose as a gasket, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then you put some nuts and bolts and washers, little thumb screw nuts and bolts. And you can, it still works. Instead of, I, I kept one overhead projector. The IT people were like, who needs this thing? I'm like, you give that to me. It's not mine. <laughs> no, that's mine. So I still have my overhead projector. <laughs> the, the first time I, I ever taught a course, was at UVM, 350 students looking at me. I was terrified. Uh, I turned on the overhead projector, and there was a jumping spider inside the projector. And I said, look at that, it's a jumping spider. And of course, in, in the big room, it was bigger than my fist on the screen. And it jumped from one side of the overhead projector to the other, and of course, it jumped across the whole room, and it broke the ice, and I was like, yeah, and they were like, oh, oh, it seems like he knows what he's talking about. That is, in fact, a jumping spider. <laughs> so, anyway, that's a long time since I've had to do overhead transparency. Thank God they were a mess. One day I went in and dropped them all. It was, it was chaos. <laughs> Yes. So water bears are too small. Uh, water bears, um, they are. They would go through the city, right? Yeah. But if you're interested in water bears, there's a wonderful podcast um, called Ologies. Oh, did you hear just, it? We just, just listened to it. it. Isn't that amazing? Oh, it was yeah. so funny. Yeah. So yeah, add, add, add anymore. Yeah. Not heard, uh, yeah, it's a podcast, and yeah. there's a young woman who is funny but also knowledgeable. And yeah flexible in her knowledge and she really helped this scholarly guy talk about yeah uh, she she water. draws she draws people up she does. yeah she, she does a tv show on saturday mornings as well oh, really? and yeah she does a, she, she does like a sciencey show yeah. i forget the name of the sciencey show but the podcast is great it is and, uh, yeah it's called Ologies. Ologies with Ali Ward yeah, yeah. and if, if if you've got uh, younger children she has a uh, smallogies which is one with no foul language in it. Exactly. Honestly, she doesn't have much foul language anyway. <laughs> no, I think her references are some of the pieces of the thing with little something yeah. that you wouldn't want your kids to have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's, there's always something like that. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask maybe a last question? Sure. You have up? I'm yeah. curious about, so you mentioned like the floods that we had last year, this year, December. And I'm wondering what that does to the aquatic diversity. Yeah. You mentioned that that the the BCs go down into the into the sediment to avoid the current, but do they also get washed down? And I'm wondering, like, does it take a while for the diversity to kind of replenish, or is is all it takes for the water to clear up and then everything just goes back? Or like, what's the lasting effects of it? It comes back surprisingly quickly. So if you think about this, um, anything living in the river has evolved in that type of scenario for a long, long time. And the things that got washed out and disappeared, that's really strong natural selection to not get washed out and disappear. So they go down into it's called a hyperaic zone. It's oxygenated water below the riverbed, and it never gets turned over by a flood. Mm. So a lot of things go down in there into the storm center, and when the storm is passed over the top of them safely, they come right back up again. 
The downside in an urban stream is all those mixed crannies get filled with sediment, which would be just like backing SD Ireland's concrete truck up to your house and running the chute in through the window. It wouldn't be fun, right? So you, you need you need the nuts and crannies. Um, but I, I, I won't sample the river for about a week after a storm. I like it to go down. I really have a chance to come back up again. And um, the scouring takes off all the algae because the algae can't migrate. And so what you've got is essentially a tiny amount of algae which needs to then regrow. So all the periphyton has to regrow. And so there's not an incentive to come back up for the things eating that. So you do need some time for replenishment of the of the, uh, the periphyton, the algae essentially. So yeah, sometime. <laughs> yeah, and then things like Irene will go deeper than than, than would be typical. So yeah, that's the story. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.